let's talk about clothing for outdoor backpacking and in particular for hiking long distances on the Appalachian Trail. We'll talk about clothing for warm weather and clothing for cold weather. We'll also talk about the costs of that clothing and strategies for keeping our expenses under control. And we'll talk about considerations of matching clothing to the AT environment. Let's start with clothes for the summer. Summer hiking clothes are usually made of synthetic fabric. The main advantage of synthetics is they dry much faster than cotton because long distance AT hikers often climb and descend 2,000 or more feet of elevation a day, day after day. They can get quite sweaty in warm weather. I've gotten so sweaty all my clothes got wet and everything in my fanny pack got damp. Also it can rain pretty heavily on the AT. This gives synthetics an advantage that's hard to ignore. Do synthetics have any disadvantages? Some people decide they might smell worse when wearing synthetics. Personally, I am capable of smelling quite bad when wearing cotton. If I'm going to avoid odor, I need soap and water and deodorant, not any particular fabric. It's also true that when exposed to fire or something as hot as a fire, synthetics can melt. They might melt onto our skin, and if they do, we're likely to get burned. At best, we'll get holes in the fabric. If we like to get close to a roaring wood fire with sparks flying everywhere, we should keep that in mind. Synthetics are so common among backpackers, we might wonder how anybody survived before they were invented. As I have said, I made my first long backpacking trip when I was 14 years old. We all wore cotton because that's about all there was. Our rule of thumb was to carry spare clothes so we could change into something dry if we had to, and we could dry wet clothes near a fire if we had to. In past centuries, wool was commonly used by those who spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Wool is still an option and we'll discuss it later. So most folks choose synthetic shirts, pants or shorts, sports bras, and underwear. Common synthetics are polyester, nylon, and rayon, sometimes blended or with spandex added. Some clothes are treated with paramethrin, an insect and tick repellent. In the description is a link on do-it-yourself paramethrin treatment. I prefer convertible pants, which have removable legs. The pairs I have came with lightweight synthetic belts. Convertible pants are my first choice. I usually carry two t-shirts and one button-up shirt with pockets. These are largely personal choices. If someone picks only shorts and t-shirts, I'm sure they will survive in the summer with no problem. More on this later also. If we sweat badly on the AT, it's probably because we are working hard to get up and down those hills. At night in the summer, however, I have been at spots on the AT when it dropped to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, if not lower. Some years are warmer than others. I camped just off the AT in Virginia several nights in 2015 while day hiking at about 2,500 feet above sea level and they were the warmest nights I'd ever spent up there. I had just come from Maryland where at sea level it was mighty hot. In any year, a hiker can expect cooler weather in Maine at the least. Usually, nights on the AT will not be as warm as nights at sea level. In the description is a link showing the elevation profile of the entire AT. If you look at the profile, you'll see the AT is only infrequently below 1,000 feet above sea level. In some long stretches, the trail is rarely under 2,000 or 2,500 feet above sea level. I have read if the sky is clear and there's no precipitation, every 1,000 feet in elevation means a temperature drop of 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. A fairly inexpensive sleeping bag can be expected to be enough for summer nights on the AT, but it helps to have warmer clothing if the summer's not a really hot one. A long sleeve a flannel shirt might be enough. Some of us will decide we need something extra when we stop hiking and cool off, so we'll be in a tent or a wooden shelter most likely. If we are, that reduces the risk the flannel shirt will get wet even during rain, and if it doesn't get wet, it's a reasonable choice. This is also why I prefer convertible pants. I can hike with the legs off and put them back on at night. Eventually, I got a long sleeve synthetic fleece pullover and started sleeping in that. I also got a fleece Peru hat to wear for sleeping. Maybe it will get cold when the sun goes down and for whatever reason we don't have enough clothes. If that happens, the traditional advice is to get in our sleeping bag as soon as we can. As I've said earlier, some through hikers walk the entire trail with a cold weather 20 degree bag. If they decide to stick with just shirts and shorts in the summer, a sleeping bag like that will help them on a cooler night. Based on all I've seen, a summer hiking shirt and pants will cost about the same as any decent shirt or pair of pants. 
In early 2016, I spotted a reasonable looking convertible pants as low as $25 and a shirt for $11, both on Amazon.com. I've discussed rainwear repeatedly in other videos, so I'll hit the main points. After trying several options, I've had the best results in summer by wearing a poncho in the rain. It's still nylon and costs about $100, and I consider it money well spent. When it comes to economical rainwear, I don't know any manufacturer that can beat frog togs. In 2016, I see frog tog rain suits for $20 in discount stores and ponchos for about half that. If we aren't careful, frog togs can tear fairly easily, but that would not stop me from buying them. I think I can avoid tears, and if I'm wrong, I can use duct tape for a patch. I would avoid plastic rain suits because they are not breathable. Frog togs are reasonably breathable, and if money is not a concern, there are many more durable rain suits available. If a hiker starts a northbound through hike before mid-March, odds are good they will encounter snow and freezing temperatures at some point. In 2016, I noticed more through hikers planning starts in February, raising the odds of hiking in winter weather. If we want to avoid winter weather during a through hike, one good option is to start a northbound flip-flop from Harpers Ferry, West Virginia between mid-April and mid-May. I've talked about that in detail in another video. The link's in the description. If we do hike on the AT in snow, it won't be exactly like normal camping in the snow. No matter what the weather, if we are trying to make distance over the big AT hills, the physical effort will keep us warmer. On camping trips, most of us don't work that hard. I have hiked a little in the snow and camped a lot in the snow. I've also hunted a lot in the snow when the goal is to be about as motionless as possible. If anybody wonders why AT hikers don't wear really heavy winter clothes, and I once did wonder about that, the warming effect of constant walking has to have something to do with it. It's also not too likely an AT hiker will encounter sub-zero temperatures on the trail's southern end. Regardless, those hikers will need winter clothing and a cold weather sleeping system. While I have found a rain suit to be optional for summer, the need for a rain suit is much, much higher in snow and or freezing rain. It probably would be best if we consider one mandatory in those conditions. A rain suit also might be a great idea in the summer in the White Mountains in New England. It can get quite windy there. Some folks carry a thin wind jacket and or wind pants, and if you need them, get them. But a lot of hikers decide a rain jacket eliminates the need for a wind jacket. In winter, I'd still go with frog togs, and the more expensive options also certainly work. It's pretty much a given that a base layer is needed for winter hiking. For those who don't know, a base layer is more or less a pair of warm, long underwear. My long sleeve a fleece pullover is a fine top half of a base layer. If anybody is looking for an effective but economical base layer, I would suggest looking first at the Camp Moore website. Personally, I do watch my spending. I bought a 20 degree down sleeping bag from Camp Moore for less than $100 when it was available and it weighs about two pounds. It might not compress as far as goose down, but for my purposes, it works great. I can't vouch for everything Camp Moore sells, but I certainly would buy from them again. In 2016, I see cold weather base layer top and bottom for about $40 total on their site. For the record, I consider many other companies to be reliable when it comes to outdoor clothing. These are some of them. Note that one company is Smart Wool. They sell many items, including base layers, that are merino wool. For those who don't know, merino wool comes from merino sheep, and merino wool makes outstanding cold weather clothing. Merino wool is not cheap, but it is quality stuff, and if we can afford it, why not? Even if it's snowing, it might get warm enough to sweat. Taking the jacket off, at least temporarily, would be the best plan if sweating takes place. It's interesting that aside from the base layer and rain pants, many cold weather clothing lists don't say much about keeping our legs warm. In a way, this is understandable. Some base layer options can be pretty warm. Even so, my legs have gotten cold during all that motionless waiting around during snowy hunting trips, so I don't take anything for granted. There are a variety of fleece pants for sale on Amazon, and some are reasonably priced. I have long been in the habit of scouring thrift shops for wool pants, and I have repeatedly found them mighty cheap. 
Even if they were plaid or striped, I still wore them while hunting. Another option is what's called snow pants or ski pants. Usually they are fleece or insulated and or waterproof. If we plan a through hike and worry that our base layer isn't warm enough for our legs, we can start that hike with fleece or wool or snow pants and send them home if we decide we don't need them. Many hikers send at least some cold weather clothes home by summer. One thing to keep in mind is some clothes advertised as fleece contain 50% cotton. This would reduce the chance the material would melt if exposed to fire. Even so, I have found 100% polyester to be warmer. One example is this hoodie on the left, 50% cotton compared to the one on the right, 100% polyester. The one on the left is okay, but I find the one on the right to be warmer. So much so, I have worn it hunting in the snow with only a tank top and fleece shirt underneath. I conclude that if it works while motionless in the snow, it would work on the AT. Neither one of these hoodies is thin, by the way. One that will work in the snow needs at least some bulk to it. Yet, a down jacket would be a lighter option. Whether fleece or down, I want a jacket with a hood. I've been in the snow with only a knit cap, and I've been in the snow with a hood over a knit cap, and I prefer the latter. Another thing that distinguishes the AT from other environments is I have fallen down a number of times on the AT. The footing is not always ideal. I would have fallen down many more times if I didn't use trekking poles. And this was in the summer and fall. In snow and ice, I might fall down more often. Experience has shown I know how to keep a down sleeping bag dry, no matter what. But can I keep a down jacket dry if I slip and fall into a creek in the winter? As you probably know, down cannot keep us warm if it's soaked and it would take a long time to dry out, assuming it doesn't freeze solid. One answer is to slow down and be careful. Another answer is products often called pocket cleats, ice spikes, or ice traction cleats. These strap onto our shoes and have metal cleats that grip the ice. Another option is to wear a synthetic jacket. I recently visited a favorite outdoor store and looked at hooded winter jackets. The cheapest down jacket was $350 and the cheapest synthetic puffy jacket was $250. I like stores but often feel I am forced to shop online. Even so, a recent 2016 online search turned up no down jacket for less than $200 that wasn't on sale. I did find a merino wool and synthetic jacket for $100. It weighs 15 ounces. That polyester hunting jacket weighs about the same and cost me about $30. Its zipper doesn't work too well, however, we have to consider all the details. One thing I would call affordable are fleece jackets with no hood. So if my upper layers were base layer, synthetic shirt, fleece jacket, fleece hoodie, and rain jacket, I'd think I would be pretty bomb-proof. The same would be true if the hoodie was replaced with a hooded down or synthetic jacket. Depending on the weather, of course, this amount of clothing might be overkill. If really cold weather seemed unlikely, I might skip the hoodless jacket. Maybe. When it comes to things like water and clothing, I err on the side of abundance and not everyone else does. I've never really gotten excessively cold outdoors in the winter, and that's probably because it's something I worry about. In the summer, many people find some kind of a ball cap to be all they need on the AT, and others use no headwear at all. There are many types of wool or synthetic caps or beanies that will work in cold weather. Also popular are neck warmers and ear warmers. At first glance, they look like a headband or a piece of a fabric tube, but they're pulled on to cover our neck like a scarf or our ears like earmuffs. And now I have a confession. When it comes to winter gloves, I have never found anything that works better than cheap gloves I buy at a gas station for maybe $3 or less so far. A couple of times over the years, I bought really expensive gloves packed with Sensolate and Gore-Tex, and in winter, my fingers felt like they were frozen inside those gloves. My daughter, who I've mentioned before, has had the same experience with similar gloves. Maybe it was the glove design and not the material. I once had some knit wool gloves I liked, but they wore out. I would hasten to add, I have a nice pair of knit synthetic gloves I bought exclusively for hiking and camping. And I have a pair of fleece and sensolate mittens that will open up so I can use my fingers. Apparently, I'm saving them for the next ice age because so far I haven't felt any need to actually use them. But if I started a through hike in February, I carry the knit synthetics. Other glove and mitten options include merino wool and fleece. 
I've talked about footwear and blisters in another video and the links in the description. When I visited a little museum in the Shenandoah National Park, I spotted these boots. The sign said a woman wore them on a 1978 AT through hike, and the sign invited me to think she wore them on her entire hike. If she did, all indications are we can hardly expect to do the same these days. Most if not all shoes will wear out or start to fall apart long before we can hike the entire trail. This pair developed a hole above the right big toe in the first 100 miles. Many through hikers will end up going through several pairs of shoes before they finish. I've said earlier I would consider leather boots for snow on the AT and I certainly would consider synthetic boots also. Many people like merino socks on the AT, particularly in the cold. I have a pair of darn tough brand socks, 65% merino and the rest synthetic. I would say they were definitely worth the money. Another option are down booties, which would be pretty good for sleeping in at the least. Gators are sold in styles for both summer and winter to keep either dirt or snow out of our shoes. Many people don't bother with summer gators, but if we start a through hike in February, winter gators might be a good idea. One popular item, particularly in warm weather, are camp shoes. Many folks choose Crocs or sandals, but more sophisticated choices are available and are helpful if we have to wade a river. After my first AT hike, I didn't use any because I didn't want to carry them. I did, however, make a pair of pretty ghastly looking sandals out of duct tape, nylon cord, and an old sleeping pad. And they are just about as useless as they look, but I carry them only to keep my bare feet off the dirt if I step outside my tent, and for that, they're good enough. And now, finally, we are once again done. A big thank you goes to all my subscribers. You are very much appreciated. If you have not yet subscribed, please consider it. There's plenty more to come. And as always, thank you very much for watching.